in the heart of the American Southwest. The 320 cops of the Navajo police patrol some of the most rugged territory on Earth. We don't know what we're going to come across out here, these desolate areas. There's always that potential that a person might fight us, resist arrest. Calm down, man. Calm down. The you know, majority of the officers who are killed in the line of duty, they're killed with their own firearm. Battling big city crime. Turn on, put your hands behind your back from there. Backcountry dangers. And even the supernatural. Mosquito up here is, it may be weird, but it's something that we still have to go out there and do. Modern day warriors on a mission to protect the largest Indian reservation in North America. And to preserve an ancient way of life. It's high noon as Officer Christopher Holgate prepares to go on duty in the Navajo Nation's Window Rock District, site of the tribal capital. It's the most populated area of a reservation that sprawls across parts of Arizona, New Mexico, and Utah. The 27-year-old has been on the force for four years. This weekend, he will be one of only six patrolmen on duty in a district the size of Los Angeles County. I'm ready to go. Holgate carries many of the tools of a modern police officer, including a taser and a handgun. Our sidearm is the Glock 22. It's a 40 caliber model, standard for every law enforcement officer in Navajo Nation. Before I came on, they had nine millimeters. Before then, they had six shooters, you know, the 357s and the 38 specials. But there's something else Holgate relies on for protection while on duty. For me, I'm, I'm traditional. I like to have, you know, myself protected. And what this bitter herb does is protects me because when I go out there, you know, I'm dealing with mostly bad people. And they like to harm you, you know, with witchcraft and stuff like that. So this is what I like to, to do right before I go to work, and I'll put some, bless myself, make sure that everything will, you know, be okay, and I'll go home safely from work. Like most Navajo officers, Holgate rides alone. Budgets are too tight, and the force is spread too thin to allow for partners. In a landscape where backup might be 50 miles away, Holgate has been trained to fight off as many as seven suspects single-handedly. There's always a challenge because majority of the calls we go by ourselves. It takes a while for another officer to respond. Sometimes we have to handle domestic calls or shots fired calls by ourselves. Just after his shift begins, Holgate receives a call. According to the dispatcher, a young man has assaulted family members at a rural home site near the town of Hunter's Point. I think I've been there before. I believe it's a trailer just right off the road. It's F4, eastbound 54. Luckily, another officer, Erwin Toddy, is passing through the same area. Toddy is a member of the SWAT team, so unlike most officers, he packs the additional firepower of an AR-15 assault rifle. It's a fight disturbance. We're requesting our assistance to remove the individual from the house. Toddy has been called out to deal with this subject before and has had to chase him down on foot more than once. Yeah, this guy loves to fight. The officers find the young man's sister waiting for them in the front yard. You see him? I'm not sure why that right there. He just pushed me away and he went off. You don't mind if you go inside? Yeah, sure. Suddenly, there's a commotion in the backyard. The young man's father alerts the officers that his son has taken off into the brush 
where the young man's mother is already trying to find him. What is he wearing? What is he wearing? A dark blue shirt. Blue shirt? A blue kit. We're going to have to run after him. Holgate and Toddy take off on foot in pursuit of the subject. Ninety miles away, officers from the Navajo Drug and Gang Unit gather for a briefing in the town of Shiprock, New Mexico. Located in the Four Corners area, with the borders of Arizona, New Mexico, Colorado, and Utah meet. In recent years, drug trafficking through the rural Southwest has been on the rise. The Navajo Nation has become a crossroads for criminal activity. Because the Navajo police are undermanned, the reservation is viewed by criminals as a soft target. Major interstates and lonely desert roads carry all the problems of the border states right up into the Navajo Nation. Some actually transport drugs to our reservation, mostly going through to another state or either up or down from Canada. So we're right in the middle of everything. Today, the Navajo police are working with agents from the Ute Mountain Bureau of Indian Affairs, the New Mexico State Police, and the Apache County, Arizona Sheriff's Department on a massive operation to stem the tide of illegal activity moving through the area. Together, undercover officers and patrolmen will scour the highways and country roads in search of anything or anyone that looks suspicious. The uniformed officers will make the stops, while the undercover agents swoop in to aid in the investigation. Many of the officers involved in the operation work undercover, so their identities must remain hidden. There have been reports of illegal drugs being transported through the Four Corners area. The majority of the drugs are being transported from southern Arizona through the Navajo and Ute Indian reservations into border towns such as Cortez, Mancusan, Durango, and Colorado, plus Aztec, Bloomfield, Kirtland, and Farmington, New Mexico. The officers are warned to be on the lookout for a number of motorcycle gangs that may be traveling through the Navajo reservation on their way to a rally in Colorado, including the notorious Hells Angels. Only days earlier, the outlaw biker gang known as the Vagos engaged in a deadly gun battle with members of the Hells Angels in Central Arizona. Uh, this is the Sons of Silence. These guys are out of Colorado. They wear red and white. Think of Budweiser when you see these guys. They court with the banditos. Uh, just because they wear red and white doesn't mean they're aligned with the Hells Angels. Then we have the Vagos. The Vagos are green and red. This is the group that recently had the shooting down in Chino Valley with the Hells Angels. They are in Cortez, they're in groups, and they're flying colors. Now, because of the recent violence and all the gangs that are here flying full colors, the potential for violence is there. So watch your safety when you're watching these guys. That's all we have. Uh, let's go ahead and gear up and be on the road by 2.30. Let's go ahead and hit it hard, man. Gilbert Yazi is an 11-year veteran with the Navajo police and a senior officer with the Drug and Gang Unit. I guess uh, law enforcement's always been in my blood. Yazi heads north towards the Colorado border on U.S. Highway 491, formerly known as Route 666, the Devil's Highway. Only minutes out of the station, He's called in to back up a fellow officer who has stopped the suspect for speeding. There's a reason why an officer's waving me over. Uh, a loaded weapon right by him. OK. Officer Marwin Joe initially pulled the driver over for speeding. But when he approached the vehicle, he noticed a handgun stashed under some papers on the passenger seat. We'll take this knife from you for a little bit, OK? Is there any other weapons he might have on you, sir? Nine millimeter in the front seat. As I looked into the vehicle, I saw that uh, handgun right there. 
and uh, unbuckled my holster and just told him to come on out. And after I, I, he was already pissed off. The officers immediately call in backup and put in a request for the K-9 unit to rush to the sea. 90 miles away. Navajo police officers Christopher Holgate and Erwin Toddy are in pursuit of a 16-year-old male who's been fighting with his family. The family looks on from the top of a ridge. Hey, stop! Get out! Get out! Get out! Get out! Get out! Moments later, Holgate and Toddy get their man. Sergeant in custody. Walking back to the unit. As we're coming down, Officer Toddy sees him, tells him to stop, and he looks at Toddy, starts running towards me, and I was just about maybe 10 feet away from him. Just then, I heard someone coming running in. So I pulled out my taser, I him to get on the ground. He freaked out, didn't know I was there. I can fit my fingers through them, they're fine. You're a big guy, you got big wrists. Okay, it's not made for comfort, it's made out of metal. Okay, what's your date of birth now? What seems like a simple domestic disturbance. Are you the mother? Actually cuts to the core of a serious problem for many young people on the Navajo reservation. Jobs are scarce and addiction is high in some areas. A feeling of hopelessness and isolation leads to depression and all too often, suicide. Does he have any problems with depression or mental illness or anything? Yes, I, I think he is. I think he is really, I think he really needs the help of that. But he doesn't want to take the medication. He said he was going to kill himself? Yes. Did he say how he was going to do that? Um, no, he, he didn't say how he was going to he was going to do it, but he just told me that he was going to kill himself. That's what he told you before he ran off? Yes. There has been an epidemic of suicides on the Navajo reservation in recent years. Tragically, in one community, there was a total of six in a single weekend during the summer of 2010. If he is suicidal and he's threatening to hurt himself, we can't really hold him. Like, I don't think him being incarcerated um, would help. I think he just needs to get the counseling and the help that he needs. So well, I'm just going to take him and get him referred to mental yeah, health, mental get, health. Get, get the help he needs. See kind of treatment that he needs over there. Yeah. All right, well, we'll head up further then. Back on the Devil's Highway, senior officer Gilbert Yazzie continues to question a man who is traveling through the reservation with a loaded pistol on his passenger seat. Have on you, sir. The Navajo police have the authority to arrest anyone involved in a crime on the reservation. Step back over here. And that includes non-Native Americans. But if non-Natives are taken into custody, they must be transported to the nearest jurisdiction off the reservation. So where are you traveling from? Utah. Utah. Keep your hands out your pockets. Thank you. Just put them on your waist. Coming from Utah, where are you headed to? Farmington. I work at the mine. You work at the mine? Mm -hmm. You live in Farmington? I don't. I live in Utah. I come oh. down here every weekend. And I always travel with a handgun. OK. Didn't know I was supposed to tell him I had a. He didn't say anything I didn't know. Yeah. yeah sometimes the driver failed to warn the officers about the handgun when they made the routine stop. Although this doesn't violate any law in the state of New Mexico, on the Navajo reservation, you're required by law to declare any firearm to a Navajo police officer. And guns must be kept unloaded and stored out of reach. If they see it, you know, it's in the high alert versus you telling them, you know, I have a gun. That's why the officer will feel more safe. While the K-9 unit searches the vehicle for any other weapons or narcotics, Officers remove the handgun, a World War II-era Russian Tokarev, 
that's loaded, sir? It is. You might want to unload that and run the serial number. And then he's going to get his papers, yeah. Okay. It turns out it's not only loaded, but it's got a round in the chamber, ready to fire at the squeeze of a trigger. Canine's search of the vehicle comes up empty, but officers still have questions about the man's Russian handgun. You don't have the paperwork for the handgun? I don't have any paperwork for the handgun, no, sir, I don't. Where did you get the handgun from? I bought it from a guy. Uh -huh. A long time ago, I've had it for probably 10 or 12 years, just a friend. This is what we're gonna do. I'm gonna go ahead and confiscate the gun for now. Uh -huh. Do I have a choice? Apparently not. The man is cited for speeding and allowed to leave without his handgun. He has failed to show the officers any paperwork that proves the weapon even belongs to him. Until he can prove ownership, he will sit in a Navajo police property room. So at least we have a handgun that's off the highway. That's how it works. Two hundred miles west of Shiprock, in the town of Pinyon, Officer Darren Yazi is heading out on his final patrol of the day. Darren isn't related to drug and gang officer Gilbert Yazi. They just share one of the most common surnames on the reservation. Names like Yazi, Begay, and Benali are shared by thousands of Navajos. Traditionally, Navajos were identified by the clans their families belonged to. But in the 19th century, new last names were assigned by the U.S. government. Yazi works out of Pinyon on the fringe of the Chinle district, in an area that the Navajo police often refer to as the Wild West, where the nearest jail cell is a 60-minute drive and backup is at least an hour away. Because the officers are so far away from the Chinle police station, they work out of the security booth at the regional school. We go all the way up to Forest Lake, which is about 20 miles from here. We go another five miles from there. So we go 25 miles north of Pinyon, we go about another 30 miles west to Hard Rock, and then you go another 20 miles to Cottonwood. That's what the Western officers cover. So it's a huge, huge area. Four miles out of town, Yazi spots a suspicious vehicle parked on the side of the road. Looks like a broken down vehicle. See if they need any help. It turns out that Yazi knows this couple well. A year ago, he tried to arrest the man for beating up his girlfriend. Okay. During the arrest, the suspect tried to set Darren on fire with a lighter and a can of carburetor spray. The officer had to use his taser and pepper spray to subdue him. He's a known resistor, known uh, offender, always runs. Yazi gets word from dispatch that there's a warrant out for the man's arrest. Uh-oh. 10 4. Stand by. The suspect's mother appears on the scene just as Darren moves in to make the arrest, and the suspect has jumped into the back seat of her car. Navajo officers often have to deal with members of a suspect's family arriving at the scene of an arrest. This represents a dangerous escalation. Open it up. As Yazi approaches the car, the suspect reaches under the back seat. What does he have in his hand? Tell him to keep his hands here. Did you hear that? Tell him to keep his hands here. OK, turn around. Turn around. Turn around. OK, you're being detained right now. What's your birthday? For what? What's your birthday? What's your birthday? Stay back over there. Stay back over by your vehicle. Okay, hold on. Nothing on you? 
The man's warrant stems from a head-on collision he was in months earlier with a tribal vehicle. Now the family's upset because I'm arresting him. Okay, he never went to traffic school, he never paid his fines. That's why the warrant is out for him. Are you guys gonna be okay here? Is that a yes? So you're gonna be okay then? All right. Yazi returns the suspect to Pinyon where he will have to wait for another officer to arrive from Chinle to take him to jail. Keep it in this position. There are no holding cells in Peñar, and the officers rely on a relay system. This means that someone will have to drive an hour in each direction just to put the suspect behind bars. There are seven police districts on the Navajo Nation, but only five of them have jails. Officers might have to spend an entire shift transporting suspects from one end of the reservation to another. While Darren waits for the relay, his brother Farrell comes on duty. The two brothers both grew up in the Pinyon area and both worked the same district. We were on a shift once, but they had to get us apart, so we worked different shifts all the time now. I have more experience than him, actually about a year. It's nice to have him around. It's monsoon season. An afternoon thunderstorm rolls across the mesas outside of town as Officer Farrell Yazi heads out on patrol. This afternoon, he's responding to a call that most police departments in America would simply ignore. But the Navajo police take very seriously. A couple in the backcountry has reportedly been attacked by people with supernatural powers, men who can change themselves into beasts, a frightening force they call a skinwalker. Basically, the skinwalker is native tradition. Navajos believe that witches can transform themselves or jump into the hides of animals. For traditional Navajos, skinwalkers are a terrifying subject rarely discussed with outsiders. They are shapeshifters, people who practice witchcraft taking on the forms of coyotes or wolves to haunt the reservation lands at night. Some believe skinwalkers poison their victims with corpse powder, the fine dust of crushed human bones. Yazi arrives at the home site, where the family claims they were awakened in the dead of night by the bizarre sounds of chanting coming from the trees behind their house. When they looked out their windows, they saw four strange figures covered with pieces of animal hides. The family eventually fled the property and waited out the night at a relative's house. The south side of the house is where the incident occurred, where the individuals were seen. When they did see them, they came out and they reported that the individuals kept running down to the road. Skinwalkers, you know, they're pretty fast. One of the guys actually said that when they came out to chase them off, one of the times that one of these skinwalkers ran down the hill and within seconds went up here to the top of the mountain. Today, Farrell finds no signs of trouble at the property. Yeah. The Navajo police receive dozens of reports like this every year. And although they rarely find physical evidence of skinwalkers, officers are required to fully investigate each case. You know, skinwalkers, it may be weird, but it's something that you know we still have to go out there and do. I have not caught a skinwalker to this day, but 
officers from the Pats had picked that one and they booked him in. They're out here. For Navajo officers, the demands of the job often clash with their traditional beliefs, especially when it comes to dealing with the dead. No subject is more taboo in Navajo culture. It's believed that harm will come to anyone who touches or even sees a dead body. A while back, I had to perform CPR on somebody, and unfortunately, that person didn't make it. According to tradition, that person's air was still inside me. Well, so this is what the medicine man was telling me. So they needed to get that air out and let it travel on with the deceased person. We've got a lot of things that we're not supposed to be dealing with. Being a tribal police officer, we break every one of those taboos. We're not supposed to be dealing with the deceased. Something so much as a coyote running across your path is a sign of bad luck. Now, I don't have time to pull over, take out my traditional stuff and do my own protection thing to protect against a coyote, which is a bad messenger. Personally, I've had my grandparents get after me quite a bit. You're not supposed to do this. You're not supposed to do that. I told you don't do this. <laughs> they don't understand, you know. If I don't do it, who will? Back on the eastern side of the reservation, the Navajo Drug and Gang Unit continues their crackdown, searching for drugs and on the lookout for gangs of well-armed bikers that might pass through their territory. Turn sure the guys are down there? Yeah, they're down there. Right now, they've already had two stacks go through, so we know the support groups are coming up for the Hells Angels. Officer Roland Dash has been called in to assist agents from the Bureau of Indian Affairs, who have made a stop in Colorado on the side of US Highway 160. What's going on right now is that these guys did a traffic stop, and there is the smell of marijuana right off the bat when you get into the vehicle. You got plain smell of marijuana. Well, right now, I got the A lieutenant from the Bureau of Indian Affairs named Dale American Horse questions the suspect. The man was headed north out of New Mexico with his girlfriend and small child when he was pulled over for speeding. Officers quickly discovered that he was driving on a suspended license and placed him under arrest. The driver admits that a bag of marijuana is hidden in the car's glove box. Uh, he admitted he had the marijuana in the vehicle. Okay. I just need you to kind of stand the vehicle now. Okay. With the driver's girlfriend and child looking on, American Horse searches the vehicle. He seizes a pipe but the drugs are missing. So what they're going to do is detain both of these individuals and contact K-9. K-9, she confirm or deny or suspicious of marijuana in the vehicle. If the woman has hidden the narcotics, she risks being taken into custody herself. With her boyfriend already under arrest, officers would have no choice but to turn their young child over to social services. Meanwhile, 20 miles away, Gilbert Yazi rolls up on the scene of a pulled over tractor trailer. We got an officer that pulled over a tractor trailer for traffic infraction. Let's see what we can find out here. In this part of the country, police are always on the lookout for suspicious 18 wheelers. They're often used to transport drugs or haul illegal weapons. And some have even been used for human trafficking. This truck was pulled over just north of Shiprock and immediately aroused suspicion. Traffic infraction? The trailer originated in Mexico, and it was supposedly already loaded and sealed when it was picked up by the driver in the border town of Laredo, Texas. The driver has been told he's hauling soda, but the officers have no way to verify it. Do you have the key to open the back? Unless if you want to break the, the luck, you know? There was a load picked up in Mexico. Uh, he's traveling this way. 
Uh, he has no key to the uh, to the back end, which is a little bit suspicious for us right now. Um, as a truck driver, they're responsible for what's being loaded and what they're carrying. Did you have the key to this? Yeah, this for safety is mine. But okay. this one here, theirs. You don't have you no, don't, no. You don't have an, no, uh, an extra break, one? They break it there and they check here, OK, here, and then say it. In addition to being padlocked, the doors on the trailer have been sealed with small pins. The driver claims they were already in place when he picked up the trailer on the border. He's been ordered not to break them until the shipment arrives at its destination in Canada. Why, why, why come you don't carry your own seals? Well, uh, I don't carry it because they have. Because some drivers usually carry their own seals. When they need to break it, they'll break it, and then they'll document it, and they'll pull out another seal, make sure that seal's back on, and have the paperwork in front of them. Yeah, that happened, you know. But... Yeah. Officers are eager to search the trailer, but they need probable cause before they can proceed. Their only hope is to call in canine. If the dog gets a hit, the officers will have the justification they need to break the seals. Okay. Unfortunately, there's only one canine unit dedicated to this operation that's spread out over 150 miles in two states. And right now, it's in Colorado. Despite their nagging suspicions, Yazi and the other officers are forced to let the driver head back out on the road. My suspicions were that he didn't know what was in there, but there's a good possibility something might have been in there. The K-9 unit Yazi was hoping to call in is actually headed toward the scene where Roland Dash and Lieutenant American Horse continue to search a car for marijuana. So far, American Horse hasn't been able to find the drugs. With K-9 on the way, the driver's girlfriend decides to come clean. She hands over a bag of marijuana. It was in the glove box, and when we got stopped, I got up there and I pulled it out. This may be all the marijuana the couple was carrying. But on a road so well-traveled by traffickers, the officers aren't taking any chances. Let's go back and dig again. After a thorough search, the officers come up empty. Yeah. If the couple was transporting a larger amount of narcotics, there's nothing left now. The woman is arrested. She's going to jail for possession of marijuana and child and birth. Her son is turned over to the custody of social services. That's about all we can do right here. At least we got a little bit of dope off the road. Throughout the afternoon, the officers make dozens of stops on US 491 and the other roads leading in and out of Shiprock. While some officers report sighting groups of bikers riding through the area, the agents believe that word of the police operation has spread and most of the gang members have avoided moving through this part of the reservation. It was successful. People seeing us out there doing aggressive enforcement. So I think it prevented a lot of illegal traffic from going on. By 6 p.m., the officers of the Navajo police and the agents from the Bureau of Indian Affairs call it a day and return to their headquarters in Shiprock for a debriefing. Well, sounds like we had a Pretty good day today. The problem is with the radio. The officers are satisfied that it's been a successful operation. The next day, Officer Christopher Holgate is preparing to go on duty for another swing shift in one of the Navajo Nation's busiest districts. Before heading to work, he stops to visit his father. Hey, Dad. Hey, what's going on? a former rodeo cowboy who serves as a trial judge for the Navajo Nation courts. Officer Holgate is a divorced father with two small children. When Holgate works weekends, eight-year-old Kiara and six-year-old Trey stay here at their grandparents' house. What are you guys watching? The main big part is spending time with my kids. 
my job is always demanding. Um, I'm always on call, no matter if I'm on or off duty, something happens, you know, I have to respond. It's hard, but you know, sometimes as police officers, this is what we do. How about grandma, okay? Dad's gonna go to work now, okay? All right, see you guys there. Give me a hug. Hey, be careful, son. Okay. I will. People are crazy out there. All right. The Window Rock region patrolled by Officer Holgate plays an important role in the history of the Navajo people. In the 1860s, when there was open warfare between the tribe and the U.S. government, thousands of Navajo prisoners of war were held captive at a U.S. Army post near the present-day town of Fort Defiance. In 1864, the prisoners were marched on foot 300 miles to eastern New Mexico, where more than 2,000 died in captivity. Despite this legacy, many Navajos today are extremely patriotic. Thousands have served with honor in the U.S. military, including the famous Code Talkers, who used the Navajo language as a secret battlefield weapon against the Japanese during World War II. Today, nearly a quarter of all Navajo police officers are military veterans. Concealing their colors until they got up there. And the sandstone formation that gives the town of Window Rock its name has become a monument to generations of Navajo warriors. Today, Holgate patrols Highway 264, which runs from east to west through the heart of the reservation. His 4,000 square mile district sits within vast portions of Arizona and New Mexico. During his shift, Holgate will have to enforce the laws of both states, numerous counties, and the laws of the Navajo Nation. He'll also have the confusing task of keeping track of which jurisdiction he's in. It's not just state lines he has to be aware of. East of Window Rock, the map of the reservation divides into a bewildering patchwork of tribal agencies and non-Native American land. It's checkerboard, as they call it. So far, it's state, county, and the next you know, like a little piece, a couple miles is a reservation, and then all of a sudden it goes to county. So it's just like a checkerboard here and there. Gallup, New Mexico lies just 30 miles east of Window Rock. Navajos refer to cities like Gallup and Flagstaff, Arizona, which are just off the reservation, as border towns. They are a major source of trouble for the Navajo right, police. Go ahead and uh, start pouring out the alcohol. Out Take care of everything. It's alcohol out. is completely forbidden in the Navajo Nation. It's supposed to be a dry reservation, but we get a lot of bootlegging. Uh, we have a lot of border towns that people go to bring their alcohol back. Once people start drinking, you know, they start fighting. Watch out, watch out. You okay? Come on, don't fall. Oh. You okay? Yeah. That's why I want you to I was sit down. Sleeping. There you go. That's why I want you to sit down. Just outside of Window Rock, Holgate receives an urgent call for backup in an area to the south. Except for the one that goes towards the uh, railroad tracks. Another officer requested for backup. I believe we made a traffic stop. It's one of the rural areas. It's a back road that actually goes into Gallup. Uh, a lot of DOAs I take this is a shorter distance to go back into Gallup. Minutes later, Holgate arrives at the scene and finds that the other officer has already made an arrest. What's your name, man? Oh, Frederick. Cedric. Frederick. Oh, Frederick. Yes. All right, come on. Come on out, Frederick. Come on out, Frederick. We're going to switch your arms out, man. Switch your handcuffs. The man fell off his bike, which he was riding while intoxicated. Watch your head, man. Watch your head. Watch your head. Watch your head. <laughs> Calm down, man. Yeah, Calm down. He's fine. All right, come on inside. What's up? Come on inside. Because the arresting officer's shift was ending when he got the call, yeah, he asked Holgate to transport the man back to the Window Rock Jail. Just have a seat right here for me, man. Can you unlock it? No, 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 no. It's going to be the way it is. Yeah, There's it two is cuffs. Off. Put your leg up. Do some documentary. 
Get up in there. Hey, but, uh, see, look at the gold. Frederick, gonna... Frederick, put your leg in. Okay, wait up. Okay, Put I your will. leg in. Let my arm up. go. Okay. Let my arm go. Well, put your leg up. Jesus Christ, Christ, Christ. We well, only told you <laughs> man. Told you once. <laughs> the suspect is belligerent and is trying to slip out of his handcuffs. Yeah, he's trying to switch his handcuffs out. As Holgate gets him out of the vehicle to adjust his restraints, the man's wallet falls out of his pocket. Just because you're doing that, I want to cuff you all the way to the back because I know you're flexible. Oh, no, no, get my wallet back. Oh, I'll pick it up for you. Don't move, don't move, don't move, don't move. Don't move, just stand right there. Well, get my... I'll get, get it as soon as I take off one of these cuffs. Relax, Dan. Shoot. I'll just be cool with okay. everybody. Shit, I think I'm going to be a documentary of everything, huh? Oh, yeah. I'm freaking man. Calm down, calm down, calm down. While Holgate struggles to secure the man to the back seat, Grab on! Put my wallet! the suspect's put, grandmother put arrives on the give scene. It to, give it to my grandma. Put your leg in. Give it yeah. to my rebel. Hey, you better calm down. Calm down. Mom. Okay. Let's get up. He'll be going in and be out in the morning. The man will spend his Saturday night in a holding cell. It's PI, man. He'll get out in the morning. That's all it is. Tomorrow morning, he'll be released to the care of his family. Okay, then. He gets belligerent at first, but once you get to calm him down, then he'll be okay. So he'll be out eight hours and then get back on the road. Although the Window Rock area only has a population of 3,000, it has much of the modern crime of a big city, including an epidemic of gang violence. We're driving through the neighborhood in Fort Defiance. We like to concentrate on this area only to the fact that we always get called here for gang call, gang fights, gang drunkenness. So this is our primary area that we concentrate on. What's your name? Gang activity has been on the rise here since the 1990s. Hang out area for them. There are now as many as 225 gangs in the Navajo Nation with an estimated 1,500 to 2,000 members. So there's all different colors, the red, the blue. There's one that says R&W, Red Nation Warriors. Most of the gangs have copied the lifestyle of their counterparts in major cities, like Los Angeles. I think the contributing factors to our gang members out here is, you know, they see gang videos, they see gang lifestyles, and they, they live it out. For officers, it's a constant struggle to keep a lid on simmering tensions between rival gangs. A lot of gang members know us. We don't necessarily just go out there and arrest them and take them to jail because that's going to be a revolving door anyways. So we would make contacts with them to try to do an intervention out here and then just kind of have a talk with them, asking, why do you still, you know, gangbang? Why do you, why do you do this? Can I get your name, please? Officer Gilbert Yazzie. You got you a know, card or anything? No, I don't have a card. Do you have a problem with me? Yeah, no, address I it don't. to me now. No, I don't. I mean, tell me, just tell me what's going on. What do you don't like about camera. it? I just want what's a card, going that's on? it. I don't have a card on me. Gilbert Big. Yazzie, police officer with Drug and Gang Enforcement Unit. Big time, like you don't have a card. That's cool. Nope. Yeah, can you write it down for me? The contrast between Window Rock and the more rural parts of the reservation couldn't be more stark. In the high country of northern New Mexico's Chusca Mountains, Sergeant Darrell Billy of the Navajo Rangers is on patrol. Billy is a seven-year veteran with the Rangers, a force tasked with protecting the reservation's most precious resource, the land itself. To the Navajo, 
the land and the four sacred mountains that border the reservation play an important role in their origins. And traditional Navajos spend each day trying to live their lives in careful balance with nature. The 26,000 square miles of reservation land are protected by only 25 rangers. So each ranger, they cover about over a thousand square miles. So we deal with livestock, fish and wildlife, land, water, oil and gas, anything that deals with natural resources. Today, Billy is headed into the mountains. Bow hunting season has just started, and he will be checking on hunters and fishermen. Any luck? Inspecting licenses. Do you want to see my tags here? And keeping an eye out for poachers. We go into areas that are very rugged to make sure that there are no legal activities are occurring. If we need backup, that's usually about over two to three hours or never. Because the rangers penetrate the farthest into the backcountry, they're often the only officers that people living in the most remote areas ever encounter. Well, these people live up in these mountains, mainly all the elderly. We'll make sure that they're doing all right. Outside of Crystal, New Mexico, Billy makes his first stop of the day, a stock trailer loaded with young bulls. Throughout the summer, weekend rodeos are major events on the reservation. But the need for rodeo livestock leads to a rise in crime as old as the West itself. Cattle rustling. Sometimes they usually take somebody out as livestock to be utilized for these rodeo contestants. If they can show proof that these bulls is theirs, then we can just let them go. Good morning. Daryl Billy with the Department of Resource Enforcement. The reason why I stopped you, I noticed that you are hauling some bulls. You have your hauling permit. Anyone transporting livestock on the reservation is required to carry proof that the animals belong to them and that they've been inspected by health officials. Billy has to cross-check the driver's records with the brands the bulls carry on their hides. See right there. Double. Billy looks over each animal, carefully examining brands uh, and cross-checking the driver's that hauling one, papers. That That's my cousin JB. That's the old ones on that. I'll look for that. Uh, Bill, I'll see on that one. Red mildly face bull with horns. That one. The hauling permit lists only nine bulls as having been inspected. So, but Billy counts 11 animals okay. in the trailer. Oh, it has a state brand button. Then I went about from uh, Buster Webb. OK. You don't have to go sell, though. This is my other truck, okay. both of them. Because right. I have another vehicle that we haul with. It's all about paperwork in there. OK. You see your ID then? Billy could confiscate the bulls yeah, you can and the whole trailer. Wow. Wow. But this time, he decides to go easy on the driver. This is just going to be a warning, yeah. but make sure you have those bulls inspected and then have them on there. OK. OK. All right. Yeah, yeah, because I, I knew. Inspections yeah, like I these know. are critical. I'll be right back. Cattle without inspection papers might not just be stolen. They could be carrying deadly viruses, like hoof and mouth disease, that could wipe out entire herds, putting the livelihoods of hundreds of Navajo ranchers at risk. We're dealing with the West Nile disease, too. So these are the things that we have to really look out for. Defending Navajo customs and culture is the ultimate goal of all the Navajo police. It's scary at times, but you know, we gotta, we have an obligation to the people that we gotta help. I just wanna check on that, make sure you guys are okay. I like to rush, I like helping people. You don't get very many thank yous in this job. But once I put on his uniform, I believe that I serve the best interests of my people. Modern warriors, 
battling every day to preserve an ancient way of life. <laughs>